Uh, thank you for your presentation and for the challenging words. It's, it's hard when you're an Anglican too, and I don't know what's wrong with Anglicans, um, but we are being um, one of those who have tried to change the world. People can celebrate uh, Desmond Tutu, they forget that he is an Anglican. So there's a space which our church allows us uh, to use our spaces and vo moral voices that we possess to bring about change. Now before I, I, I say what I want to say today, I just want to, this is the most important thing you can do for me. I was looking at this as I came in, and I am on the one man um, campaign, <laughs> and I mean every word, because I don't know when the UN, UN AIDS, became the conduit of child rape by respecting it, calling child marriage, when we know in those very countries there are laws which say having sex with a child of a certain age is a crime. We baptize it, and the simple thing is this, because it's a female body. Please, those who work for the UN, this language should die. Let's call it for what it is. It's child rape, and the people who are involved, the parents who are involved, deserve to go to jail or else we won't resolve it. And I've said this over and over again, I'm a father of girls. And I think it's an insult to the woman world that we continue to call it marriage. I don't know how a nine-year-old girl can get married when we know the law says she's being raped. So let's stop this language, please. And I'll keep on talking about it until the UN, UN heads and ever drops it. Because unless we call it for what it is, it will continue. A crime is a crime, and we together can stop it. Now, thank you for, for your uh, good presentation on, um, on gender roles. And again, I'll start from there because that's the most important thing. The assumption is that a female body belongs to a man. And across the world, as we know, when I'm a human rights activist. I'm also openly, and I don't even hide that I defend gay rights. I don't even call them gay rights. I call them human rights because I know that people, whether they are gay or not, they breed like I do. They hate when I lie about them, but they also die. And the way I feel when people demonize me or lie about me, that is the life of an ordinary gay person where people who don't even know their lifestyle are the experts of what they don't know. And of course, religion comes in there to sanction that. And we have done a lot of damage, not just to women, but to our fellow human beings. And behind every genocide, we know the truth is religion one way or another. It happened in Nazi Germany. It happened in Rwanda. And those who go to try and stop it at times it's too late. And I think it's our mistake as human rights defenders to try and say we don't believe in religion because we are seeding the ground. There are a lot of things we can use in, in, in various sacred texts which demand uh, that we respect the human rights for all people. And I believe that we can go through that and accept it. That is another tool we can use to advance human rights for all to make this world a better place. My sister started by talking about religion and defining it, and I don't want to repeat that. What I can tell you is that she's right. You know, the word religion does not exist in my, my culture because it's part of who I am. And in case you don't know, Africa can have 1.2 billion people soon, but half of that number will be, is likely to be Muslims and the other half is likely to be Christians. So when you're working in Africa, that's something to pay attention to. And I know people don't realize it. And as we heard, the biggest challenge we have within America is the assumption that religion does not matter. But listen to the president when he speaks and he says, God bless America. If he doesn't say those words, everybody will be upset. 
I was just uh, speaking at, at the, <laughs> during the break that the reason why I think Romney failed to win the election of Obama is because he's a Mormon. That is something that people used. And you are very respectful. You don't want to say it aloud, but when you go in that booth, you are going to use that to say, I can't vote for a Mormon. So America is really religious, even though they want to pretend they are not. But for us, if you go beyond America, what you are going to see is the global nature of religion. And this is something we don't pay attention to. Unlike human rights, religion is, most of the world religions have got this global reach. So you like it or not, if you're a Christian, your goal is to reach all the nations on earth. And your goal is to try to make everyone Christian. And I tell you, if we didn't have the courts, we would have gone away with it. But unfortunately, the courts stop us from doing that. So is Islam. Islam has got also this global outreach. If you're a Muslim, you go to India, for instance, you see the mosque, you just enter it. You don't need to explain anything because you're one of them. If you're a Christian, you go to Zambia or Kenya or Kenya or, 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 or Zimbabwe, you see the church, you enter it because you're one of them. Unlike human rights, we have to find out, I have to Google about you to find, okay, do I agree with your politics or not? But in church, I know which church to go to. As long as it says Anglican church, I'm there. As long as it says a mosque, I'll go there. If a temple, I belong to that, I'll go there. I might not understand the language, but the rituals will be almost the same. And that's what makes me feel at home. So in as much as we want to look at religion, just nationally, let's just look at it from the global nature of, of these religious groups. Uh, and one of the things people don't even realize, and that's something that threatens the Western world, including Europe, is Islam. Because whenever they go now, they are seeing these mosques popping up, and the question is, are they going to take over? Well, don't ask that question, because Christianity took over somewhere else, too. You know, in the during the time of the famous David Livingstone and the group who went looking for places to, over, to take over, let's talk about what happened in Latin America. Christianity did the same. So maybe the Muslims are just it's their turn to do that. And that threatens many people. And I say that if a religion cannot survive, then let it die. And if Christianity has no sense of realizing what good it brings about, my thinking is then it is not worth it. Let it die. But if it has values that people respect and uphold, other regions can exist and people it will continue one or another. And that's why I'm not afraid of my brothers and sisters from other faiths trying to do their work. But the most important thing I want to bring to your attention is this, that behind what we see, there are some values that we are trained into. We may not be aware of them because when we start observing those values, we don't even know what it's all about. We are taught what you know, the temple looks like. We know, the moment you see it, you know that's the temple. And that's why how it comes about in terms of influencing our values. There are things we take for granted or things we do not realizing that we are doing that because of our religious convictions. In terms of marriage and more so into, uh, when you talk about sexual minority ri rights, the biggest you know, thing I found so fascinating is how Christians, Muslims, Buddhists and others who come together when it comes to LGBT issues. My brothers and sisters in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Christian right, the U.S. Christian right, for instance, they are mad that Obama signed that deal with Iran. But when it comes to the LGBT people, oh God, we are brothers and sisters. We are prepared. That's what religious religion does. If it is convinced that something that is happening is not good, we have to build these bridges, right? And the only people who can try to destroy that bridge are the people themselves 
who are inside. And that's why I've kept on saying, don't run from the mosque if you are a gay person or the church if you are a gay person. Because until you are inside, the other group won't see your humanity. And when they start reading those sacred texts, it makes a very big difference when you are sitting next to an LGBT person. If they are not there, we are operating in our mental state. And that's something I've come to learn. When people talk about women's rights, for instance, it is discussed in abstract. You will hear, oh, so women want to appear like men, okay? But when the men see what you know, those religious convictions, how much they can destroy other human beings, when we lose, like I did, our own relatives, my sisters went, after she spoke to me that she wanted to divorce, and I said, my, the Bible does not allow. It changes you completely. And for, for me, I have said to people in my church, I won't counsel anybody when there is, you know what, domestic violence involved. Because I've taken sides. My sister is always there. Whenever I talk about it, she's there standing with me. I would have saved her if I told her, don't worry about religion, do the right thing, and run away. But this is what we have done as religious people. People respect what we say. And again, that's another reason that we should take religious leaders very seriously and hold them accountable. Because at times you tend to think, oh, that guy is a lunatic. Okay, he's a lunatic to you. But there are people who are listening to him and who believe what he's saying is true. And we are going to act on them, on that. So we should not say, oh, that is just politics. Because there are people who respect the religious symbols and they won't do anything without you know, that religious frame being present. So let us learn to be more savvy. The other thing I can tell you this, one of the things I've come to realize as I do this work is how our you know, opponents or my brothers and sisters on the other side want me to denounce the sacred text, which is true. They want you to say, I don't believe in the Quran, or the, Quran, the Bible is nothing, is useless. That's what they want you to say. And I say, you're making a mistake to say that. Because that's where they want you to go. What we have to do now is to use other values, that which the Bible condemns. And for me, I have a simple way of saying it. I would just say to a man, I say, oh, yeah, the Bible, I respect the Bible. That's why I love the Bible. It's an abomination for a man to shave. That's what the Bible says. And then they'll tell you, no, 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 no. I say, because the values of the Bible, what the Bible propagates, or the sacred text propagates, it is a lived reality. People tend to self-select what to believe and what not. And if they are not involved in it, then they say, the Bible says. When they do it, then they'll say, no, let's talk about that. Didn't the Bible say that uh, it's, it is, it's wrong to mix colors in your dressing? The same Leviticus, I'm just being honest. Theologians can help me with that. I didn't say that. I, maybe I'm making it up. And that a man to keep the hair like this is what? Strong. We are supposed to, to, to do what? Take it off. The woman to, no, there are so many other things. And more so, I love Paul. Thank you for talking about Paul. One thing I like about Paul is when he says that the women should keep quiet. So when I'm talking to the other side, I say, why are you even talking to me? Because the Bible says, you are supposed to sit down, go call your husband to come and talk to me, not you. No, that's different. Let us get to that space. Because all the values that religion propagates, they, are, they have to be justified by the social context in which people live. And that's why what religion was or Christianity was in the 18th century, differs from what it became in the, in the 19th, and it differs in the 20th century and in the 21st century. Because the context in which we live, we try to use those values that we have learned, and at the same time try to borrow from other parts of the world and make those choices. Now, you like it or not, you may not believe the power of religion. What I can tell you is this. 100 years ago, for instance, in Africa, there are only 10 million Christians. 10 million Christians. Today, Africa is boasting about almost uh, 600 million 
people who are Christians within 100, 100 years. So, and when you are making this, you no, know, especially for those who are involved in human rights work, what you have to realize is this, that the people who sit around that table with you, especially if they are coming from non-Western context, they either have their Bibles in their bags, or mostly they are likely to be either Muslims or Christians, they are coming from Africa. So you can talk and talk and talk. They, are, they go back into their rooms and close the door and say, what were you talking about? My religion does not agree. Why am I saying that to you? It's for us to realize that the only way we can bring about social change is by understanding the, the things that influence certain actions and how can we transform those within the respect or the confines of that uh, region. For Africa, you like it or not, you are not going to go very far by denouncing religion. But you win by going back to the sacred text and accepting their authority, but then asking the people themselves to see that it's not everything that we, we just copy and apply. And finally, I want us to say something about the question I, which I care about too, of my brothers and sisters who are LGBT. You know, this is a big question for the feminist movement too. Because African religious leaders are very opposed. But even some feminists, they don't see why we should have to talk about this. We have to talk about this issue as an important issue. So they will tell you, yeah, we can talk about it, but not that. Human rights groups in Africa and many other parts of the world can talk about everything. But when it comes to LGBT use, rights, they not talk about it. And if we don't talk about it, then change won't come. And that's what we have seen across Africa. We are seeing new laws to stop people from just talking about it. Because it's through talking that we learn. It's through talking that we learn to see the humanity of other people. And my prayer today is this. In as much as I respect my tradition, I respect the Quran, but I also realize that the face of what I've called the blood of our brothers and sisters who are LGBT persons in Africa is on our hands if we don't stand up and speak for them. But like I spoke about marriage, they have a challenge for those of us who are involved in sexual rights to think about it. Why is it that when a gay person is killed in Africa today, the U.S. president will talk about it, everyone will talk, the U.N. will be talking about it, everyone will be talking about it. But when our sisters are raped, mutilated and thrown on the streets, we don't hear that. What is wrong with us that we have grown to accept the biasness that we try to fight against? that continues to demean our fellow human beings simply because of their agenda. One thing I know about all the religions is that God is the creator of every one of us, and we, res we reflect God one or another. And my challenge is, if you really believe in the rights of every human being to be human, then you should be outraged when a lesbian in South Africa is killed, or in Brazil is raped and killed, when a young kid is taken as a wife, when an old woman is taken as a witch because of traditional beliefs, again, it doesn't make sense, it doesn't make any international headline, when they are burnt alive, it doesn't make international headlines. For how long are we going to be quiet? For how long are we going to be part of a system that kills? For how long are we going to ignore the tears of the abused woman, the sexually assaulted young girl, an old man, woman whose problem is to get old? I believe we can do better. Please, let's stand up and be counted.